session of Irish History from the Hedgerow at the Irish Roots Cafe, produced by irishroots.com with Peter Riley Adams and Michael O'Laughlin. Find a spot on the warm, sunny side of the Hedgerow now. Today's session is about to begin. They were rough, unpolished men, brilliant scholars, teaching by the side of the road, in small rooms, in nooks and crannies, wherever and whenever possible. Such men as these, they were the teachers of the hedge. Well, welcome back to the sunny side of the hedge row. We've got a good day today, so we are outside. Uh, sometimes we take cover on the veranda here at the cafe, but uh, it's a real nice day today. So just as they did back in the early days, uh, they might take shelter by the hedge row, uh, the sunny side of the hedge row, it's always mentioned. And then as time went on, they'd build a little uh, shelter for the students and the hedge school. So we're real lucky to have both things uh, working for us here today. And I was wondering, Peter, what did you think about all this uh, Viking history that we've covered so far and where we're headed with it? Well, I think it's actually very amazing uh, that here come these peoples to Ireland, this beautiful land that they see uh, from the Latin Hibernia. Uh, and they, they see, they see um, a lot of things to take advantage of the crops, the land, the economy. Some say that uh, the the Norsemen came for economic reasons. And uh, as we research and as we discover, we come to see what is that value there in, in that island? It's magnificent. And the one thing that, of course, happened, uh, which is of most interest, is that the two seem to accept, yes, because of battles and differences, there was a tremendous assimilation and we're discovering that as we go forward. Right. I think we'll talk a little bit more about that today, too. Uh, looks like it's about time for class to start. So, uh, okay, three, two, one, everybody to their seats. Yes, that's it. Okay. Well, today we're going to start and uh, continue, actually do our final chapter on just the Vikings, and then we're also going to do a, a session just on Brian Baru and a, a battle at Clontarf, which opens up a whole can of worms for those people studying Irish history. A lot of questions are opened up, too. But today today we're continuing on with the uh, uh, Vikings Part 2, and we're going to be talking about— uh, we had just talked about how the Irish kings had already been plundering the monasteries, which were centers not just for religious life but for uh, the physical life and the wealth of the community. And now we're looking at about the year 830, and the raids became even more intense than they had been in Ireland and England and Europe. And uh, gosh, you look in the 830s, uh, uh, there's captives being taken by the uh, uh, Vikings, and uh, the province of Connaught, they say, was devastated. And in 837, a a 60-ship fleet arrived on the Boyne, and also a 60-ship fleet arrived on the Liffey. So you're starting to see some uh, big powers starting to move on Ireland. It's not just an isolated attack. They'd been testing Ireland out for about 35, 40 years, and uh, they thought they found some weak points. And um, about in this era, they also came up the Shannon and the Urn, and there was a fleet on Loch Nee, uh, and they used that as a base into the Midlands. And the Vikings even built their first stru- structures known as long ports, which were ship enclosures at Dublin and at Louth. So all of a sudden, the danger to the country has increased quite a bit, wouldn't you say, Peter? Oh, absolutely. And the the ships are, the Viking ships are very important. There's one thing a lot of people don't know. There is one fjord in Ireland. It's called the Killery Fjord. And it's between Galway and Mayo. And the Vikings were very accustomed on their fjords, because there's more, this is the only one on the British Isles, of going in and out of those. And this fjord is very long and very deep, uh, which is interesting. The rest of them were coming up, because the Shannon, they didn't know what it was. It was just the river. They didn't know where it went. And the fjord, of course, ends. But the rivers were the obvious way to come in. If you go to Dublin, you've got the Liffey. If you go to Cork, you've, you've, you've got the lovely Lee. And, of course, if you go to uh, come in from Galway, you have the Shannon, and the Shannon goes all throughout the country. And this was uh, giving the Vikings an advantage, and they were a sea people. 
Well, yeah, and so they, they continued to build up there after they built those long ports, and they wintered at Dublin for the very first time. They used to take off for the winter. They'd hit and run, but that was starting to stop. And that was in I wonder uh, 18- I wonder Michael how long they wanted to stay in Dublin if you've ever been in Dublin in the winter it ah. can get very rainy and very cold you know <laughs> That's right I wonder why they changed their mind and they got two more fleets came in in 18, 842 you know I keep saying 1842 cuz I'm used to that century sure, sure, but it's sure. eight, 842 and uh, you know about that time is when you've got the first written record of the military cooperating between the Irish and the Viking uh, kingships there, or the chieftains. And that would start a pattern of where the uh, Vikings just became more and more uh, acting like a uh, an I- Irish clan, and they'd ally themselves with different kings dependent on their needs at the moment. And, uh, you know, the, the very first uh, intense independent attack started to appear again around 845 and that's when these fleets started to to stay over the winter and uh you know it really looked pretty seriously there for a while that that ireland might be overrun because uh they were pretty much having their way with things and the irish kings just didn't show an effort to unify the ireland uh, uh despite the fact that some people say they were ardries or high kings did you run into that peter well the audrey you know, the king and there was there's been a big question has there ever really been a high king uh in the sense that who accepted anybody as the king because of the tribal rivalries and uh some were you weren't allowed to go take over that king you had to respect that king's position so and if you did then you had to obey and it's something another topic we'll have to talk about you had to obey the brian laws and and you those were the same uh, for peasants as it was for for what we thought or what we would say would be royalty. They were the same. You, you, you had to obey the law because the law became the highest point. But sure, there was great rivalry in the Adri, uh, which again, we'll, as we said, we'll talk on a, later uh, is Brian Baru. And there were some others who said they were the Adri, but they were their loyalty they didn't receive the loyalty that they would expect from all over Ireland. You know, yeah, a better term would probably be that they were over kings. They were over several kings, but not over every king. And it was just military threat that quieted their enemies down. And every king had a friend or an ally that would join in the fight and try to put the guy that won the last battle down. So it was really a never-ending battle. And, uh, you know, we were talking about how the Vikings had been building up around 845. Well, they even end, ended up at that time having a fortified position on Loch Ree and on both sides of the Shannon River. So they were digging their uh, uh, claws in pretty deep. And, you know, that Shannon River was something that uh, uh, Brian Brew would later come in to covet. And there'd be a bunch of uh, trouble there between the Vikings and the uh, Dalcasians. Uh, and remember, the Dalcasians um, decays. Uh, the Dalcasians are the tribe uh, from which uh, Brian Baru descended. They came up and they settled in uh, uh, the eastern part of County Clare. And, uh, but, you know, the Irish did fight back back then when they were doing that. And uh, who was this fellow, this Viking they called Turgisius? Turgisius. He was actually, it's kind of interesting with him that uh, because he was the one that— um, about 845 in some days that I saw, after all the foreigners in Ireland recognized him as a sovereign, uh, though it would hardly be said that he founded a kingdom, but they recognized his authority. And as you said, you know, a lot of it was done by force and by might. So uh, he was probably recognized because he probably had the larger armies. Well, though his, uh, oh, just, excuse me, uh, that his best opponent, though, was Neil from Ulster. Of the Uniel. That's right. Yeah, the kings of the north. It was uh, Max Schenel who came in and actually captured this Viking who had stuck his head up to call himself the and overlord. He was the king of Meath at the time, wasn't he? Yes, yes, I believe so. And he, uh, what did he do to him? He drowned him. Uh, of all Put the his nerve. head in the water. How can you imagine at, that? At Loch Owl. Okay, ooh, and it was a message to all those in Ireland who would challenge the power of the Irish uh, uh, that seriously, I think. Well, some historians said it was either done as a criminal act or the act of saints. Uh, <laughs> and depending on which side of the battle you were on, you'd make your decision there. Uh, it's true. It's like, you know, we're gonna before battle, we'll pray to God. What are you doing? You're asking God to help you murder your enemy. And, of course, that's what happened. Still they, does. Yeah, and they do it on both sides. And, you know, by the end of that decade... 
the Vikings had had. Now they've got, instead of being hit and run, they've got fixed settlements, fixed positions in Ireland, and that made them much easier targets for the Irish because they didn't jump on these ships and just leave, uh, uh, which, which made them almost uh, undefeatable if they could get to their ship in time. And uh, those Irish-Viking alliances continued. The Vikings became a part of Irish politics and uh, supported specific Irish kings and and they were attacked by specific Irish folks, and you're going to find them on both sides of the battle, and you're all going to so, so going to be finding them defeated more often. Uh, you can see in that decade they were defeated at Ossory and Dublin and Screen and Castle Dermot and uh, in Cork by 1849. 849. Oh yeah, that's right. Eight. I'm going to have to. What things that. going on in Cork in 1849? <laughs> yeah, that's right. And and that same year there was a fleet of 120 ships that arrived and those we think were uh, probably the Danes coming over from England and uh, the Vikings started to fight each other just like the Irish had been doing to themselves. Oh, certainly. You know, there's a one faction that, that I don't think is, is talked about, but when we say that uh, the Viking, uh, whether you want to call them the Danes or the Norsemen, because they, they can all be interchangeable words. One of the things the Irish did uh and there is a lot of evidence toward it with the Viking kings. There was conversion to Christianity. And from a historical point, if you go back to when Rome was being sacked by the Visigoths and the Goths, the Pope, at the time Leo, he he didn't know how to deal with this, and he was by this time actually the kind of the emperor of Rome. He wasn't too sure how to deal with these people coming in and wanting to slaughter so we came up, he sent missionaries out to meet them, and they talked about Christ, and they converted them. Well, when you've converted somebody, one Christian isn't going to kill the other. Of course, that does happen, but that was part of the premise. And so some of the Irish did the same thing. They were able to go into the Viking or the enemy, the foreigner, the one who's coming, and they converted them over, and then this brought, at times, periods of peace. In Ireland, you know, I started to feel an affinity for those Norse that had settled in Ireland because they were like our Vikings, and uh, those Danes from England came over and they challenged our Vikings to uh, some pretty fierce battle, and there was 160 of the Norse Irish Vikings, really, uh, uh, that had settled in Ireland that attacked the uh, Danes that had come over from England at Carlingford Lough, but they were defeated even at that time, and... uh, uh, still, at that time, some of the Irish had actually helped the Norse in that battle. So uh, it was a two-way street with all this fighting and, uh, and the Allies. And around 850, uh, Olaf the White arrived in Dublin. And what you said you knew what a white designation meant. Yeah, that, that's uh, there were the blacks and the whites. <laughs> it had nothing to do with color. It had to do with your costume, ah. actually, or what you were wearing. But some say that the blacks were the were the, uh, the 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 Scandinavian more Scandinavian and the white were the Danes. Okay. They were just two groups and as you said they came over from England and that. You know also uh, there's a time in mainland Europe we know about the area called Normandy. Well, actually the Vikings forced the French king to give them that land. And it became the land of the Normans and in order to stop them from destroying his kingdom, he gave it to them. Yes. And the England controlled England, Norsemen, the Norman, who do you want to put in there? They actually controlled that land for a long time. And as we've moved into the future, things are separated. But land meant where it was there, where I could go get and get my vegetables, get my produce, get my whatever it is I need, the bounty of the victor. And it was all over. It wasn't something that just happened in Ireland. It was things that were happening all within that region. And uh, if you travel to the region, you'll discover nothing is very far away from France and Spain and England and uh, and Ireland and Wales. That's right. And I think I'll finish up the ninth cent- century here. Uh, uh, I just said Olaf the White had arrived in Dublin, and he, along with Ivor, who was an- another uh, Viking king or overlord, they decided to rule Ireland together and uh, to organize things, which is just a you just seen this happening over all these decades. The the first they was hit and run, and then they made settlements, and now they've got a common leadership, and uh, they became like any other small Irish state, small Irish petty kingdom really. And uh, you'll see that they started to settle at uh, Yall 
and uh, Viking fleet was even destroyed there at one time. And, of course, the Limerick Vikings, who were not really the same as the Dublin Vikings, the Limerick Vikings were tied to the Hebrides. Uh, when they needed help, they'd go back that direction. And even then, Limerick Vikings, they were getting it uh, pretty bad. I, I read so many times where it says, well, the Irish king went in and the Limerick Vikings were destroyed. But then they were destroyed again five years later, and it they was. were destroyed again ten years later. So you wonder, does that mean they just killed a bunch of people and knocked some buildings down and they were rebuilt? There's been some in battles that you only kill those who are in your territory. You didn't go further to their territory because that would be almost an insult. So if someone had invaded your territory, you went and killed them, but you didn't invade their territory. That way you hoped to keep some sort of peace. That's right. And, and the Vikings of Waterford and Wexford and St. Mullins, they had all been destroyed, according to the annals, uh, uh, by the last decade of the ninth, ninth century. And uh, the Dublin Vikings were even getting a little ambitious, and they, ambitious, and they looked uh, towards attacking Scotland, which they actually started to do. And there was uh, ended up, after this unity with the Vikings, there was a major split. One between the son of Ivar and two was uh, was Sigfrith, and he led to the de- that union, and then the split between the Viking leaders led to really their defeat in 902. And uh, by the mid-9th century, things had changed a little bit. Intermarriage, uh, wasn't it becoming common? Very common, and it was acceptable. You know, uh, and it became, again, that's if, if someone marries in, then you're family. And if you're a part of that family, and this is part of the tradition also in the Brian Laws, if you're a part of that family, you don't attack your family. You don't do things to your family. You recognize them and respect them. And this intermarriage helped the Irish because the Vikings were there, the more powerful. And there were some Irish, and we'll find that out as further, some Irish women who became very powerful uh, with the Vikings and uh, with other Irish who grew up as uh, the leadership. Boy, isn't that the truth. I also want to say that by the, in the 10th century, Dublin, Limerick, Cork, Waterford, they were all walled cities. Today in Ireland, Derry is the last of the walled cities, and you can still find some of the wall. Up in Galway Town, there's a wall in, in the bottom level of that shopping center there. You walk through it, and they'll say, well, that's the remains of a Viking wall. The Viking wall, yeah. And I thought, sure. good gosh. And you walk by it like it was nothing, but really it, it's a part of history. And, and there's also a, a, a resurgence of interest in uh, Viking history in Ireland. On the Liffey, by the Liffey River, which flows through Dublin, the in front of Dublin City Hall, there is this U, made out modern art metal Viking ship because to remember that here's some of the beginnings of this city was because of the Vikings. The museum there, uh, they've got some nice displays on the Viking settlement of Dublin. I remember seeing a while back when they had a uh, a special exhibit. might have been 20 or 30 years ago. Well, I was in the the, uh, museum right um, right by Linster House. It's right next door. And the works that are in there, the the metal, the gold uh, that were be a jewelry in a sense, or was it the the helmets and the sword? They have a tremendous collection of Viking uh, memorabilia in that uh, in that uh, museum, the National Museum there in Ireland, right by uh, on Kildare Street, right off of the uh, uh, Linster House. Oh yes, and 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 this you know, really we're at a point now where we're coming to the end of what we'll call the uh, first great Viking wave or invasion of Ireland. And as you come to the mid of the the mid ninth century, we talked about the intermarriages became common. The Norse started to become Christian, and it's interesting to note that in the annals, after about the year eight sixty or so, you see the Norsemen referred to less and less as pagans. But when the new invasion starts with the new people, uh, vagabonds, you might say, when they came in in the tenth uh, century you'll see the word pagan start to appear again because they hadn't been uh, ameliorated into the Irish society. And really, as we said before, there really was no Ardry at this time, just a lot of overlords or overkings that might grab power and hold it in certain areas, but not for the whole of the island. And uh, uh, that brings us to the second Viking invasion. And uh, really, it's beginning in the 10th century. And uh, 
a lot of these folks are coming out of Normandy that you were talking about early, Peter. After a long period of fighting in France, uh, Rollo and the Danes, who had settled in Normandy and had become Christian, it had now filled up and stabilized. So they were saying, well, where do we go now? And one obvious point was that they thought might be a little easier to, uh, uh, to attract them was Ireland. That green land sitting out there uh, in the sea, and what a it was a jewel. Uh, and uh, they saw it as a place to go. And the story, because of the trade, you know, trade is a very important thing. It's how you actually, in those times from, from early in the Roman Empire, it's how things became, you became aware of what was out in the world. Today, of course, we're, we're aware of what goes in the world because of television and radio. They were aware of things because men got on ships, they went from place to place, and they came back with stories. And the stories they brought back about Ireland made Ireland an enticing place. That's right. So this second Viking invasion came uh, due in large part to the to the Vikings talking with each other in, in, in the different countries. And so they came maybe originally from Scandinavia, but this invasion came really not from Scandinavia, but from Scotland and the Isles and uh, northern England and uh there had already been ties established between these different groups of, of uh, Vikings. And so it came from uh, much closer to home. And those defeat, those uh, fleets of the Vikings around 914 or so started to descend on Ireland just as they had in the mid ninth century. And you started to see a replay of history. Uh, the province of Munster was attacked and they were not prepared to defend themselves. Uh, so, so finally some of those Kings got together and they marched to the plain of Cashel and uh, to have battle, but it didn't really end up uh, as a decisive battle, although a lot of people were uh, slain. Uh, you're going to see more and more battles between the Irish and Citric of uh, Dublin, uh, and the Irish were getting a pretty bad uh, taste of defeat, but they were putting up a battle, so the, the Vikings couldn't run uh, haphazardly through the kingdom, but they sure held the power. And the new king of Terra, who was Donshad, he uh, raided Dublin and the Norse, but the Dublin still held power. And uh, they also, the Norse then started looking not just at Ireland, they started looking over to York, which was in some ways a wealthier trading post than Ireland would ever be. So they had some forces sent on over to York. Things are going back and forth here. There's fighting all over, and it's not just Ireland, and they're all interconnected. And the uh, Dublin Vikings attacked the Vikings of Limerick uh, several times, but that was to no available and then there was for several decades, or at least one decade, around 1925, uh, pirates were just a common sight on the Shannon and on the north and northeast coast. So uh, no matter who you were, you could be in trouble if you were hitting the seas around those times. And uh, the Vikings... And people were protecting their possessions. And yes. So, uh, and others were trying to gain possession. And the economy, as now and as then, it always had a, a very important... Uh, play in how people were going to act with each other. Uh, they, if they couldn't get the wealth here, they'd go other places. And finally, around 944, the Irish king, Murtaugh, he settled to Scotland and he ravaged the Isles, according to the annals. And uh, the greatness of Dublin wasn't quite as big as it had been uh, from around the mid-10th century. It started to, started to decline because these battles were taking their tolls on the uh, Vikings, just as they had on the Irish. Uh, gosh, you know, we ought to sort of make some summaries here now, Peter, uh, on the effects of the Viking Wars and the settlements. Uh, how here, here we're coming to an end of really an era after those set, those set, that second set of invasions, and uh, Dublin was still important for the Vikings, wasn't it? Absolutely, and because of the port, uh, there's no doubt. Uh, you know that there you come into Dublin Bay, which is a very Large today, Dublin still is very important because of shipping, but uh, it was a trade center, and you could come into Dublin, go into the bay in Dublin, and then you could go down through the Liffey, and so it it maintained itself as very important, and you could uh, others came to Dublin. It was a major city, uh, whatever we would call a city. Also, one of the things, the word uh, beyond the pale, ought to be remembered because outside the walls of Dublin, that was the pale. It was beyond the pale. That was the other end. Also, another is it beyond the way of acting. 
the way you should be acting. But a lot of it came because of what was going on there in Dublin. Dublin's a major uh, player in all of this for the Vikings. The uh, Dublin, the dark pool, as it was called, uh, by the by the Vikings. And so the Vikings saw it as very important. As things happened, the Vikings, many of them also were Christianized. And so then there became actually the Irish Viking. And the Vikings used the Irish in some of their other things. They weren't just conquering the land. They were using the Irish. They became a part of them. Well, that's right. And that Dublin border, uh, you talk about a spear of influence where, where Dublin was sort of considered that it ran down to uh, Wicklow in the south and up to the north to maybe uh, the Delvin River, including Swords, and uh, wex, west to Leakslip. And uh, as you mentioned before, that was known as Fingal or the land of the foreigners. Now, what about uh, now? Limerick was still there, wasn't it? Did sure. Dublin still held power? After, and of course, that's the that's the mouth of the Shannon. That's right. So you have the, the the mouth of the two major rivers, Shannon, of course, being the larger. But those were they were right there. And if you look uh, from the um, from the monastic view, uh, if you in Dublin, you go south of Dublin, County Wicklow, there's Glendalough, which was a major monastic settlement in in Wicklow. And, of course, on the east, on the west coast, rather, you have uh, Clonmacnish and uh, Cork and Row. And if you go further north, past Tara was the hill, you know. And that has a interesting bat because that's also where it says that Patrick uh, claimed when he set the fire and Leary said no fire should be lit. And Patrick set the hill and then marched into into King Leary's a pagan uh king but also a little further north there you have newgrange where were the ancient tombs of another thousand years before that uh, there, there's that area it's full of history and full of want and and interest well and limerick was also the uh, second most powerful uh, site really when you come to the viking settlements and like I said, they were tied to the Hebrides, and they had outposts in Thurles and Cashel and Lochree and La Corib. So they were a secondary power of the Vikings, but and they were always, uh, uh, one way or another, at odds with those Dublin Vikings. So there wasn't a great unity there. And uh, Waterford, of course, was tied to the Dublin Vikings or the Dublin Norse. And Cork had been founded in the 9th century, and they held land uh, to the northwest of the city in the 12th century. And uh, Yall was found in the 9th century, and there were communities in Waterford and Wexford and Limerick and Armagh and Tipperary. So uh, they were sort of just nipping at the edges of the, uh, of the island and entering uh, uh, the society through that uh, venue. And there was a difference between the uh, Vikings in England and the Vikings in, in Ireland that I have read about. And they said that the... Uh, the Vikings in Ireland were really under Irish rule and Irish law, such that it may be. But in England, they were unto themselves with a separate code and a separate law. It seems that the the Vikings came to respect the Irish. And I, again, as I mentioned, and we will again, the Brehan laws, the Vikings liked it. And they thought it was a wonderful code of behavior. So they be, were influenced by that. Well, that's right, and maybe their their lifestyle was a little more similar uh, to the Irish than it was to the continent or to England. But the uh, from the 10th century onward, I think we agreed on it uh, all through this, that the greatest influence was economic with ships and trades. That is the influence, the final influence of the Vikings. Absolutely. And when, you, you know, you were talking about Cork, remember there's Cobe Harbor and there's uh, Kinsale Harbor. And those two are magnificent harbors, which were very influential. Cobe is at the, is at the uh, mouth of the Lee, and uh, Kinsale is the harbor itself in the town. But they're both in Cork, and they also were tremendous trade centers. Well, you know, we're coming to really about to the end of part two. And part three is going to include, of course, some of the Vikings, but it's also going to center on Brian Baru. There is one more thing we should cover before we go. I thought it was important to deal with uh, the uh, uh, late uh, 10th century. The Norse actually set up their own mint because coins were not really used in Ireland. Uh, it was that primitive of a society, so to speak. That didn't happen until, oh, after the Battle of Clontarf in 1014. Well, because of the great trade, 
uh, they needed something else. And it's said that the Vikings are the ones that that uh, produced the first Irish coins. And, of course, that was how others could trade. If you could accumulate some of those, like it's called money. And uh, rather than just be bartering uh, with what it is you had to offer, no matter what it was, this became another way for other people to be involved in the trading. That's right. And actually, the, the Norse had used coins before the Battle of Clontarf. What I meant to say was they lightened they made the coins lighter. They used less metal, made them less valuable after the Battle of Clontarf. And they say that by the time the Normans invaded, uh, they had just done away with the coins again altogether. I don't know how true that would have been. So I think uh, the last closing would be that there's no high literary effect uh, on the Vikings' raids into Ireland, uh, except for the violence in Leinster, and that might have caused scholars to leave there to go to the Shannon Basin. Uh, but it was trade and economics that did it. So when we come back for uh, the third of this uh, really three-part series, we're going to focus on Brian Baru and uh, the Battle of Clontarf, which uh, certainly uh, uh, the Vikings paid a price for that battle, and so did the Irish. But that's going to be really interesting, and we're going to learn some things that uh, I sure didn't know about until then. Uh, Peter, any thoughts for the third part of this series? Well, one of the things that we'll have to add on to is Irish hospitality which came out again of the Brian Laws and how the Irish treated people. And that was something also that won over some of the Vikings. When they came to pillage, they pillaged. But then when they met the Irish and they were becoming involved with them and they discovered how hospitable they were, how interested they were in sharing and in learning, this helped change some of the, uh, some of the Vikings' positions. Oh, I can't wait to hear it, and uh, that's going to do it for today. We're on the sunny side of the Irish hedgerow, and we'll be talking to you uh, in our next episode, and it's just going to continue the story of uh, the Vikings in Ireland and how the Irish responded. So ends this chapter of Irish History from the Hedgerow. The entire series is available at www.irishroots.com. We have broadcast series on genealogy, song, local history, as well as original publications for every county in Ireland. The head school in Ireland was totally reliant upon the local community to survive, just as we are here today in our modern-day head school. If you believe in what we are doing for your community, please do send us your support. You can sponsor a session of Irish Hedgerow History for as little as $100 and become a recognized scholar of the hedge. You will also receive a pass or letter of introduction from the instructors here at the school, as was the custom of the hedgerow. So keep the hedge growing with your donation, subscription, or membership. Thank you. We have been available for speaking engagements, exhibits, tours, and educational events since 1984. You can reach us at the Irish Roots Cafe on Twitter and Facebook and on our homepage at www.irishroots.com by mail at our U.S. location, the Irish Roots Cafe, Box 7575, Kansas City, Missouri, 64116. Leave a message on our phone recorder at 816-256-3360. Copyright 2009.